Smart Irrigation Month is a, is a national campaign that is really spearheaded by an organization called the Irrigation Association. They're a nationwide organization that work with municipalities, they work with people in uh, the industry, so contractors who install irrigation systems, and they do ongoing training, they, they publish education and resources and disseminate information uh, for folks that work in the landscape and agricultural irrigation industries. And so July was selected as Smart Irrigation Month because nationwide it's, it's the month of the year where we have the most water consumption as a whole across the United States. Uh, temperatures get hot, it's peak of summertime, so people are irrigating their, uh, their landscapes, they're filling their pools, they're doing all those things. And so it's a perfect month to think about water and the importance of water conservation. And so when you hear the, the term Smart Irrigation Month or you hear July Smart Irrigation Month, just think that it's of this, this nationwide um, kind of educational campaign that other communities and other uh, people around the country are, are also doing. In fact, the city of Edmond and the city of Oklahoma City and in, in past years, the city of Tulsa as well, have all made proclamations from, uh, from the mayor and the, the city managers proclaiming July as Smart Irrigation Month in those communities. So last week, I taught a class here as well, and I don't think any of you are here, but I taught a class called Smart Irrigation Month Simple Irrigation System Checkup. And what we did in that class is we focused on really what I consider the, the important step one in having you know, efficient water use in your landscape. So if you do have an irrigation system, that's gonna be making sure that it's proper, properly operating. So making sure your, your irrigation schedule is um, the schedule that it needs to be on. Are you watering the right amount that you need for your landscape? Are you uh, properly mowing your, your yard so that you have uh, grass in the, the heat of summer that isn't being stressed out and also is retaining any moisture that is there? Um, are you doing routine maintenance? So the simple irrigation system checkup fact sheet, you have that in your folders today. That will walk you through essentially what we, we covered in the last workshop, step by step, how to, how to do a visual inspection of what's going on in your landscape. We found that most people, when they, they actually take the time to visually watch their irrigation system operating, they're, they're just amazed at some of the issues that they come across because our irrigation systems are often running in the early morning, or at night, we're not out there watching them very often. And even if we are, maybe we have a, a spot off of the back porch or uh, from a window where we can see it operating, but we don't often take advantage of seeing the entire landscape um, in operation. And so when we do that, we're able to see all sorts of issues, broken heads, heads that are watering driveways and into the street. And so we covered a lot of that last week. And certainly if there are questions at the end, specific to that, I'd be happy to address that. And, and then my contact information is in there as well. You can, you can always reach out to me um, or you can find some information in the fact sheet that we provided. But we will focus today really on, on the technology side. But it's important to know that the technology that we're gonna talk about which can help you improve the efficiency uh, and, and the water use in your landscape is dependent upon having some of those other things sorted out. So if you have broken heads everywhere, you have a, a system that is extremely poorly designed, the technology can't fix those. Um, it can make you more efficient, but it, it's, it's kind of like, um, you know, you've, you've got to fix the, uh, the foundation of your house before you start thinking about um, all the, the fancy other repairs that you'd want to make. And so today we're going to focus on things like uh, rain and freeze sensors, soil moisture sensors. We're gonna talk about weather data and how you can, you can actually retrofit your controllers um, at your house so that they are taking in real time weather data and weather information and making adjustments to your watering schedule based on the actual climate conditions and not based on the, the whims and, and the guesses that uh, you have to, to deal with as a homeowner. We'll be talking about things like nozzles and things like that. So when we talk about smart irrigation technology, You'll likely see two of these, these two here on the, on the far right, these two labels. And most commonly, you'll see the one in the top right, the EPA water sense label. If you've ever gone into you know, an appliance store and you've seen maybe a washer or a dryer or something that has the Energy Star label on it, 
that shows, that's the EPA saying that this, this piece of machinery, this device has gone through some sort of testing that has uh, certified it as more efficient than um, alternatives to this product, other kind of base model products. And the same is true for this EPA WaterSense label. You'll see this when you go, and in fact I have it, I have a, an example here we can look at later, but you'll see it on irrigation controllers, you'll see it on irrig any kind of water use, landscape water use devices, and now even to some degree you're starting to see it um, on devices that are used in the home, so faucets and things like that. You also will start to see, as you, as you look around at products and things, you'll start to see less often, but you may see this smart water application technology sticker or label put on things, and that's what you see there on the, the bottom right. Just be aware that when I'm talking about smart irrigation technology, there are certifying bodies or certifying groups that are out there um, actually performing tests and things to, to actually uh, provide you some confidence as a consumer with the fact that if you purchase this product, you install it properly, you use it properly, you can achieve a certain level of efficiency and savings with irrigation. So the EPA WaterSense label, you can see this on, like I said, a bunch of different products in any of the, the stores that you would buy irrigation equipment, any of the big box stores. Um, it is measuring that the performance of this product that the, that the label is on is uh, better than its less efficient counterparts. And usually it has to achieve a 20% uh, greater efficiency than, than what it's being compared to, than, than the average uh, product. And so it's, it's going to achieve some measurable results in terms of water savings for you. The, the other label that you'll see, this smart water application technology, is actually a testing that's done by the, I, the IA, the, the National Irrigation Association, which is um, the group that does July Smart Irrigation Month. And what's different about the smart water application technology testing is that they actually do testing on the products and they put all those results on their website. So you can actually go look at different controllers, you can see how they perform in certain categories compared to other controllers. So if you really want to shop around and see what is going to be the best product for you in terms of efficiency and, and even efficiency in different areas, then I recommend going to the Smart Water Application Technology website, the IA's website. Um, the EPA WaterSense label is a great um, label, but it is a pass-fail, so it's it, it's at least 20% more efficient than you know, the conventional alternative, but it doesn't tell you how much more efficient. Yes, sir, question. I uh, just was curious, what, that, what is that web address? It is irrigation.org slash SWAT. And this is the website. If you, if you go to this website, you'll see, you can actually click on uh, the, the tab that says water efficient products, and you can scroll down on this web page, and you'll see that there's rain sensors, soil moisture, controllers, weather-based controllers, all of these different technologies that we're talking about, and you can click on that and see uh, and learn more about those products on this website. It will, so you can actually go, for instance, this is the irrigation controller page. This, this, um, this web page here, you click on that, it'll open up a basically a PDF from the web page, and you can scroll down alphabetically by manufacturer and product name. You can see these products and see all of the specs and the information provided there. So that's a great resource if you're thinking about getting a new irrigation controller, you're thinking about um, maybe installing an irrigation system for the first time and thinking about some of the products and things you would like to have utilized and incorporate into your system. It's a great way to go and do some homework ahead of time. So as we jump into to some of the issues and some of the, the applications of the technology to solve some of the issues that we see, something we talked about last time in our, in our workshop and something that I think is worth mentioning again today is the high pressure issue. I think this is probably something that almost all City of Edmond homeowners will be dealing with to some degree in their irrigation systems. So the average pressure delivered here in the City of Edmond is somewhere between 50 and 60 PSI sprays and rotors that we use in our landscape are designed to operate at 30 and 45 PSI. Now that may not sound like a big difference to jump from say 30 to 50 PSI, um, but actually as pressure increases in the landscape, you start to lose efficiency and it's exponential, the, the rate at which you, you lose efficiency. And what I mean by that is 
as the pressure increases, uh, not only does the efficiency of how the water gets applied to the landscape decrease, but also the, the flow and the volume of the amount of water you're using increases. So you're using more water to get less water on the landscape as your pressure goes up. And so uh, you, you probably have all seen high pressure if you've watched irrigation systems operating. A uh, classic example of that is this picture here to the left. That's this misty, kind of foggy appearance you see. And sometimes you'll see it do what I call back billowing, where you'll see these kind of clouds billowing back off of the irrigation. You'll hear high hissing sounds. Those are all examples in, of uh, high pressure. However, as you saw here in this first picture on the right there, you can actually take a pressure gauge and get an actual reading of what your pressure is and determine uh, the, the range that you're operating in and, and then how to best proceed to fix that. So here is what I mean. Here's a visual example of what I mean by you're losing efficiency. On the left here, you see this first picture. And this is a, an example of a spray head operating at 30 PSI, which is what it's intended to operate at. It's putting out 3.3 gallons per minute at that single head. And it, for the most part, you know, it could be a little better, but for the most part, we've got the coverage we wanted. We've got the, the uniform coverage that we expected to get. As you shift over to the right, the picture here on the right, you can see that as we increase pressure by 20 pounds, we not only use about one and a half more gallons per minute at that individual head, but our coverage was probably reduced by two thirds. So as pressure increases, our, our efficiency decreases and also the amount of water we're using. And so as homeowners, one of the, the most simple and effective things we can do is address the, the high pressure we're, we're dealing with in our home irrigation systems. Simply using a, a different head that is regulating pressure in the head, a few bucks, we can change out the head, we can reduce the pressure, and we can use less water um, and water more effectively. effectively. And those are adjustable? Those are so if you see the, the heads in the landscape, you, you simply would screw off. The question is, are those adjustable? You would screw off the, the cap, and inside you'll pull out. I didn't bring any examples today. I should have. You'll pull out the, the guts of the head, and then you'll just put the new one in and screw on the cap. So if you can thread a light bulb into a, a lamp, you can change the, the irrigation head. Okay. So, but are there irrigation heads then that are adjustable to the pressure? They... They, they don't have irrigation heads that are adjustable to the pressure. Um, if you want to control or adjust the pressure, they do make valves, and we'll talk about that here in a minute, valves that, that allow water to flow into each zone, and you can dial the pressure at those. Those are uh, called uh, pressure sink valves. <coughs> so when we talk about replacing heads, what you want to look for for heads that have pressure regulation are things if you see here, this first one, this is a Hunter make, and it says Pro Spray uh, PRS. So that PRS stands for Pressure Reducing Spray Head. On the Rainbird model, you'll see this. It says PRS right there. And then the Toro make, or the uh, Toro make says PRX. So that PR stands for Pressure Reducing. And the cost difference is going to be 2 or $3. So a, a traditional head might be a, a 2 or $3 cost, and you might spend five to six dollars on a pressure reducing head. But when you, you saw in this, that example here that I just showed you, there's a 1.5 gallons for every minute of runtime per head difference. So you think about, do the math on how much volume you're losing and wasting. It pays yourself, it pays you back so quickly to address high pressure. Another thing you can think about in your landscape, is there a question here? Yes, uh, going back to replacing the, the head by most of the cans I've always seen, they are not interchangeable from one manufacturer to another to screw somebody else's head in. They, is that correct? It, it will depend. Um, Toro is usually a different thread, but Hunter, Rainbird, and a lot of the other manufacturers are interchangeable. Honest, I don't know which manufacturer is in my yard mm -hmm. at the present mm -hmm. time, but probably I would need to replace the can and the head at the time. Uh, not necessarily. The, the body itself that's in the ground can stay there if it's in solid condition. The only thing you'd have to replace is the, the internal parts. And you certainly, if you want to stick with the brand you have in your landscape, then you could go look at the head and it'll tell you the brand right there and you can go, um, you can go find that and replace it. Yeah. Uh, and if, but you don't have to stick with the same brand. So the, the brands can be um, 
interchanged. It's, it's best to have consistency within a zone. So if you're gonna use, say, your front yard, um, and you have a zone that comes on all, all one at the same time and you're watering turf, it's best to use all of the same type of head in that zone. But then you could go to your backyard and you could use a different brand, a different type of head, it doesn't matter. Um, but there are gonna be some subtleties in terms of the, the amount of uh, output per head and per brand. And so if you can keep uh, some consistency within each zone, that's important. And that's a great question. What if you have different types of grass? That's what I have. Tall fescue. So the question is if you have different grasses mixed within the same zone. Um, that can certainly be challenging because you're going to have to have more water for the tall fescue, at, at kind of uh, generally speaking, more water is going to be needed to maintain that tall fescue, usually twice as much uh, than, than would be needed for the Bermuda. And so that can certainly be challenging. And that's, that's an example of how as we change our landscape, the irrigation system um, sometimes is outgrown in the sense, you know, we, we, and so sometimes we need to think about how we may be having parts of our landscape rezoned or, or um, in those types of situations, you might, um, you might water up to, you know, what you need, which would mean you would be overwatering the Bermuda to get the tall fescue enough water, or you can, uh, drag a hose and kind of do what we would call um, spot watering in certain areas. So you, you would certainly have some management challenges that come along with having two different turf grasses in the same zone. And so then you just have to figure out how to best address that as, um, you know, as your needs and um, abilities allow. Yes, sir. Just one more question related to this, the heads. The efficiency level of the three different manufacturers, are they all about the same? Yeah, there's, there's not any difference in terms of the manufacturers. They're all gonna be reducing that pressure down to the optimum 30 PSI. Now, where you can have some differences is, you know, the, the nozzles, which we're about to talk about here. Okay. Um, so the question was, are, are there differences between manufacturers with efficiency? I used the Hunter heads before. Yes, sir. And like those, and they were very efficient when I before I lived, before I moved a year to any, any of the major brands and manufacturers are all very, very consistent with one another um, in terms of their performance. Um, certainly there are some subtleties in terms of situations where there might be a, you know, personally you might find an edge for one brand or another, but as a whole they're going to operate um, the same. So here's an example of the nozzles. So the nozzles are, you know, when we're talking about a pop-up spray head. So that'd be a, a, a typical spray head like this that pops up and it sprays a fixed pattern, not a rotor that's going to be moving around the landscape. And when you have spray heads, you have diff typically have different nozzles depending on the, the size of the area you're trying to water. And they're going to be different colors. So this, this one you see here in the picture, I think is a 12-foot a nozzle. You'll be able to see, if you look at this picture here on the left, you'll be able to see right there, it'll tell you a number. And then this is, a, this is a van nozzle, which stands for variable arc nozzle, which means you can actually control the, the angle that it, or the arc that it throws. Um, older conventional nozzles have a, what, what's called set arc. So you have to buy a corner uh, nozzle that's gonna spray a quarter circle. You have to buy a half circle nozzle. You have to buy a full circle nozzle if you need it to, to water in a full circle pattern. These newer nozzles that are known as van nozzles stands for variable arc nozzle. You can actually buy one single nozzle. You have to buy uh, specific to the distance of throw that you need. So you'd buy a different nozzle if you were throwing eight feet than you would if you were throwing 12 feet. But within those nozzles, you can control the angle of arc. And what's really cool about that is that there are sometimes those challenging corners and, and edges and places in our landscape where a, a standard arc nozzle is going to lead to overspray. And so it can really allow us to get to some of these really weird um, angles and, and water those effectively. The newest nozzles you'll see out there are what are called HEVAN nozzles. And those stand for high efficiency variable arc nozzles. If you look at the pattern, so here on the right you see the pattern of this water spraying looks a little bit different than this one. And the reason for that is is that it's putting the water out 
at a slower rate and, a, and with larger droplet sizes. So you're gonna have less susceptibility to wind drift. You're gonna have more effective application uh, with your irrigation. And based on this, this is, these two are, happen to be Rainbird uh, makes, but all manufacturers make some type of high efficiency variable arc nozzle. The specs that they put forward as manufacturers say that you can achieve between 35 and 40% efficiency, uh, gain in efficiency using the HEVAN nozzles versus conventional nozzles. And is that the same thing as the nozzles? Should all be the same, same zone by band or HEVAN? Uh, certainly it, it helps to do that. Um, you, would, you would not want to mix a conventional rotor and a conventional spray head in a, in a zone. And the reason for that is, is that a rotor, so the question is, do you wanna have the same nozzles in a zone? And, and the answer is no, because you might have different areas with different distances, right? You might have a, an area where it widens out and you need to throw 12 feet, and then it might narrow down to an area where you need to throw only six feet. And so you would have some differences in the nozzle sizes within a specific zone, but you would, you would not want to mix a spray head and a rotor because the, the amount of water they put out in your landscape is gonna be much different. So um, most people would think that a rotor is gonna use more water over a given period of time. So if we talk about this in inches per hour, a rotor puts out about 0.75 or three quarters of one inch for every one hour of runtime. Whereas a spray head ranges somewhere about one to one and a half inches of water that it puts out for every hour of runtime. So this can be anywhere from a, a quarter to three quarters more uh, water usage using a spray head. And so when you mix those types of heads, two different types of heads within a zone, you're gonna have an area that you're overwatering and, and an area you're underwatering when you compare them to one another. And so um, to answer your question, you, you will have differences in the nozzles. Is, are rotor heads more efficient than these spray heads that we see here? And the, the short answer is, is no, um, but also yes, in that they're gonna, be, they're gonna be using water more slowly. So when you think about how you irrigate a zone that has rotors, you're gonna, th you're gonna have probably longer run times, right? Because they're putting out water more slowly. Um, but what you're doing is you're able to effectively cover a larger area. So rotors are gonna be used for areas that have 12 to 15 feet or greater uh, distances that you're trying to cover. Sprays are gonna be your small landscape beds and small turf areas in the landscape, okay? And so that's the major difference between those two types of heads. And these operate at a little bit higher pressure, but the same principles apply. So this rotor is going to operate best at 45 PSI. But if you had 50, 60 or greater uh, pressure, you're still gonna run into the same issues that we see right here where you're losing efficiency and effectiveness. Does that make sense? Okay. Thank you. Yes, sir. Great questions here. And, and one thing you'll find with irrigation is that it's, um, it's easier than you think, but it's also a, a, a can of worms at the same time. There's so much that you can't cover in a one hour class. And so um, what I'm trying to do today is expose you to some of the, the technology that's out there, building upon some of the other things that we've already <coughs> talked about in previous sessions. When you go to look at your controller, to buy a controller off the shelf, you'll see a bunch of different things. And you may, you may think they're all the same. You may have purchased a house and it had a controller on the wall that you inherited and, and you just mash buttons and try to figure out what to do. And that's okay. A lot of people are intimidated by their irrigation controller and, and hopefully you get past that and you start to get familiar with it and, ho and hopefully by the end of today, you're a little bit more confident with how to approach it. But essentially when we think about controllers, there's, there's two types of controllers. There's what we would call a standard controller, which is just your, your basic, basic model. It's the, it's the Ford Taurus of the irrigation controllers, right? It, it does what you need it to do. It gets you from A to B, whereas the uh, little bit more techie and it's gonna involve a little bit more uh, bells and whistles, but it can also help you uh, be more efficient at the same time. So a standard controller, I like to liken it to a kitchen timer. Really what, it, what you're doing is in a, in a, a little bit uh, more sophisticated way is turning a dial and tick, 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 tick. you're just waiting for that timer to, 
to ding off and move on to the next zone. So you're watering with a kitchen timer. And with a, with a smart controller, you're able to use technology, remote access, and some of the things that we'll talk about here in a minute. But all controllers, no matter what they are, the controller that you have at your house, uh, hanging on the wall in your garage or outside, are gonna operate on some kind of some basic um, functions. So they're gonna be hanging on the wall. So this, this here controller that you see in this picture, wherever it's hanging in your landscape, is gonna be powered into uh, a power outlet somewhere. And it is gonna be then wired through wires that are buried underground to individual valves in the landscape. And so each of these, these valves, we've got three here, represent the, what I call the gate to a specific zone. So if you've got zone one, there, it ha the water has to pass through this valve to, to and it opens and closes to get to zone one, two and three, and so on and so forth. You've got water supply coming from your city supply, so the main water supply going into your irrigation system. And so your question earlier about where can you, can you dial pressure down? Certainly in, in extreme cases where your pressure is extremely high, you can actually replace these valves um, and, and they, you can reduce pressure at the valve. And if you've ever walked around your yard and you've seen the little green boxes that are in the yard, those are where the valves are located. Um, usually they're, they're you know, kind of off to the side of the house. Sometimes you'll find them in the middle of the yard. But when you pull back that green lid, you can reach down in there and that's where you would access those valves. So to kind of give you a picture of what's going on in your irrigation system. So putting this all into perspective, you know, I kind of threw a lot of, a lot of things at you at first. What we're talking about with smart irrigation is trying to help you figure out how much, how often to water your landscape. You know, right? so, so let's talk about Bermuda grass here. I know that some of us may have tall fescue in uh, parts of our yard, but as a whole here in central Oklahoma, predominantly we're going to be dealing with warm season turf grasses like Bermuda grass. This chart here, I, I just selected the months April through September average Bermuda grass ET. Now what that means, that, that ET is uh, short for evapotranspiration. And really it just, it's a fancy word for co combining evaporation and transpiration. So evaporation of course is water that's lost through the, the heat and, and the sun's radiation on the soil and it, and it goes up through, you know, it's the third grade water cycle that we learned about. That's evaporation, right? Transpiration is basically what the plant takes up out of the ground and uses or, and, and then um, and it needs for its growth. So when you combine those two things, so the water that we're losing because of how hot it is outside, um, how windy it is, plus the amount of water the plant actually needs, you combine those two things, that gives you what's called an ET rate. Every plant, every crop has an ET rate given its, you know, what type of plant it is and where it's located, all right? So this information is based on about 30 years of historic data taken, taken from a weather monitoring service that we have here in the state. And what we know is the month of July, based on how hot it is historically and how much water Bermuda grass needs, we may have as high as 6.6 .6 inches of irrigation need for the month, all right? We usually get about 2.9 inches of precipitation for the entire month. Uh, we, we would sure love to have that right now, which leaves us with about 3.7 inches of deficit, okay? So when we think about, you, you always hear the, the common recommendations, how much do you water your yard? An inch a week, right? An inch a week, you probably heard that. Um, so that's where we get that. If you divide 3.7 into the four weeks in July, that, that gives you a kind of a rule of thumb of about an inch a week. And then the question that I always get is, okay, I, I, can, I need to water my grass an inch a week, but how do I know, you know what an inch is? Um, I told you earlier that the very, very simple rule of thumb, which is, um, is to know what type of sprinkler heads you have in your, your landscape. Of course, if you're operating at the right pressure uh, for spray heads, which is 30 PSI, and you run them for one hour, you put out between one to one and a half inches for that hour of runtime. So you think about that in your head, if you've got a zone with spray heads and you know you need you need to put out an inch of water, it's gonna take about an hour of runtime split up into different applications in order to get that one inch, right? So um, for instance, that could look like two 30 minute 
run times if you have water uh, soil that's going to be able to take a 30 minute uh, run time and split that up into twice a week or it could be you run your irrigation three times for uh, 20 minutes or whatever that looks like for you and the needs of y your landscape. Now when you start getting into uh, situations like you over here where you don't have an irrigation system uh, I don't have an irrigation system at home either, and I'm watering with a uh, combination of hand watering, drip irrigation, other things that I install. And it becomes a little more complicated because you don't have the, um, the advantages that an automatic system affords you, but it's, it's still possible to do that. So you can, you can use rain gauges, uh, which we can provide you, put those out into your yard, kick on a, a, sp a sprinkler uh, that you attach to a hose, and you just see how long it takes that rain gauge to fill up to one inch. You time it. And then that's kind of a, a, a rule of thumb way to know about how long you need to water in order to get your one inch. Somebody suggested to me just put on an empty tuna can. Yep, tuna can's a great way to do that. And, and most tuna cans um, are about one and a half to two inches in depth. So you know you can you can kind of do the math based on that, or you can stick a ruler in there and mark a line. Um, it doesn't have to be rocket science. There's some real applied ways that you can you can put this to, to use in your um, the way you manage your landscape. But what, I, what I'd like to point out though, you know, is that when you pay attention to this chart here, one thing that you'll notice is the water needs month to month are changing, right? They're not static. So the biggest mistake a lot of people make is at the beginning of the season or maybe they never change their, their irrigation schedule. It's either off or on, right? And so the biggest mistake a lot of people make is they, they get their controller set it's doing what they want it to do and they just, they're slowly backing away because they're afraid if they touch it again, it's gonna blow up or something, right? And so they don't ever change the schedule. If you wanna get uh, as efficient as possible with how you use water in your, in your yard, your landscapes, you're gonna change the amount of time uh, that you're watering from month to month because the needs are gonna change. So when we think about the year, think about climbing a mountain. So you start the climb in the early spring and you're at the base of the mountain, right? And you're just taking a step up and you're watering a little bit more and a little bit more as you get into April and May. You may slow down depending on how much rainfall we've had. This year, we about washed away, so I, I would have told you don't water. But in a normal year, you've, you're, you're increasing your water use a little bit. You get to July and August, you're at the top of the mountain. You're using what I would call your 100% schedule. So you're watering the, the most that you're gonna need for the whole year. Then as you get through the hottest part of the summer, you start your climb back down the mountain until you get into September, October, and November. Depending on your landscape, you may not need to have your system on at all at, at that point. So I hope that, that kind of helps put a picture into your mind of, of how you should think about watering. We've got a question here. Yeah, and so when you do water, like you said, you water like an hour for the month or whatever. Is it better to do five, uh, 20 times, 20 minutes five times or is it better to do half an hour or a couple times? And obviously at half an hour it's gonna go a lot deeper. Yeah. That's a great question. So the question is how when, when you think about how to plan for your watering, how do you break that up? Um, do you water a few times and do it for a long time or do you water a, a short periods and do it a lot? And we'll talk a little bit about that here a few slides from now, but as a rule of thumb, it's always better to water what I say, I call deeply and infrequently. So you wanna to try to get as much water as deep into the soil profile as possible. And, and you also wanna think about the, the plants that you're growing. So a turf grass is gonna have root systems that are maybe 12 inches deep at most, whereas a tree is gonna have root, a root system that might be multiple feet deep. Right, it might be several feet, and so when you when you think about watering, you're trying to saturate that root zone and then let it dry back, and then you want to saturate it again, let it dry back. So for turf grass, it's going to mean you're you're watering more frequently than you would if say it was a tree or an established perennial shrub in the yard. However, the more frequently you water, the more you condition a plant's root systems to stay shallow. If they aren't forced to go search for water, they're not gonna build deep, strong root systems, which is gonna lead to you know, all sorts of other issues down the road. They're not gonna be as, as strong, uh, not as susceptible to stress in the future. And so it's always best to try to water as deeply as possible and at as uh, few times as possible. But that's gonna be different for every landscape, 
It's going to be different for every area of the landscape. And so you kind of have to just kind of get to know your landscape. If you have a really sandy soil, your water is just going to flush through that soil really quickly and you're going to have to, to water um, more frequently. Um, if you have a really heavy clay soil, you're going to water it and then it's going to start to pond pretty quickly because it takes a long time for that water to get through those really tight soils, clay soils. And so the best option there is to chop your watering up a little bit. So it's really going to depend on the soil that you have, the conditions you have. And so you really have to, to put um, some of the principles that you learn to play and just make decisions based on what your conditions are. But that's a great question. So for turf grass and clay soil, how many times? Yeah, if you have a pretty heavy clay soil, you're, you're probably going to be watering, uh, you're probably going to start to see runoff and ponding if you have a runtime any longer than 15 minutes. Um, and so you can decide how you chop that up. If you want to do uh, 15 minutes and you want to do that four times a week, you could do that. Or what I sometimes will do is do 15 minutes and do what's called a cycle and soak approach. Do a, do a say two 30 minute run times, uh, or two 30 minute watering periods, but I might do two waterings on the same day and then wait a few days, do two more waterings. But I spaced it out, those, I spaced those waterings out so that I have fi maybe 15 minutes early, early in the morning and then a little bit later in the morning I do another 15 minutes. That allows time for water to get down into the soil profile before it ponds and runs off. So you're allowing that first 15 minute watering to soak in give it some time, and then you come back and you do it again. And um, I prefer that method, but you, you can decide what's best for you. But typically, if you've got a heavy clay soil, if you start getting above that 15 minute mark, you're gonna start to see a lot of ponding, a lot of runoff, because the soils just aren't, can, aren't able to, to take in water that quickly. Uh, sometimes it's sooner than that, and so that really comes down to you sitting out there, turning it on and kind of watching. And once you start to see a noticeable pooling, you know, it's not, infiltrating anymore, then cut it off and, and you can time it and see how long it takes for that to happen. This is a, an example of what I mean by the, um, what I call, it, it's a seasonal adjustment. I was talking about that mountain that you're climbing for the year. If you don't have a smart controller, something that anybody can do with their home irrigation controller is they can go to it and oftentimes it'll have a little here, thing here on the, the bottom that says seasonal adjust. This happens to be, so here, a uh, Hunter Pro C controller. And so Hunter controllers are going to have it right here on the bottom left. If you have a Rainbird or a Toro or other controllers, this seasonal adjust feature is there. It just may not be in the same place. So just look for it. It's going to be on your controller, most likely. Um, and you'll, you'll look for something that says seasonal adjust. And what you're doing is you're finding a set schedule, a set program. So let's say you decide to water three times a week for 15 minutes. Let's say that you decide that that's the best thing for you. you would, that would be what you would call your 100% schedule, okay? And you would, set your, you would set that as it's gonna water every odd or even day that you set it to based on uh, wh what your needs are. And then you can go into the seasonal adjust and you can, for, for January, February, March, and April, you can just have it off. For, say it's a warm season grass and it won't water at all during that time period. Then you could come in in May and you can set it at 75%, June 85%, and July would be your 100% schedule. So what it actually does is in real time, it modifies your standard schedule as a percent. So it will, re it will automatically reduce um, your, in, in May, it will reduce your standard 100% run time by 25% to, to effectively, uh, uh, adjust itself for what the, the climatic, the month to month conditions are gonna be. So this is an example of what I would do, you know, if I lived here uh, at, at one of your homes and I was going in and trying to set a seasonal adjust schedule for my controller, I would, I would probably do something like this for Bermuda grass. So I'd have it off in the, the winter and early spring. I would have it off in the, the late fall and winter and I would water, you know, probably three to six, or up to six months out of the year, and I would adjust it up to July and start adjusting it back down into October, and then I would shut it off. Now, of course, if you have a tall fescue or a cool season lawn, you're gonna have to think a little bit differently. You're gonna have some, some water needs 
all the way into maybe as late as November and as early as March. Um, and so if you have tall fescue, I would, I would do something like this. Now when you get to areas where you have tall fescue and Bermuda mixed in the same zone, then you just have to make some decisions about, um, you know, maybe you're still watering the Bermuda longer into the season, even after it's gone dormant in order to get enough moisture onto the tall fescue that you have. Or maybe you're just dragging a hose and plugging it up to a, a, a sprinkler and, and watering a specific area in the landscape. Yes, sir, question for you. The controller you're showing, that controls your whole yard? This, this controller controls your whole, whole yard. This is an automatic sprinkler system. So, I'm sure that we're not the only person, but we have a lot of area that's in heavy shade that's got the tall fest, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and then lots of open area where something that controls the whole thing all the time doesn't, it sounds like it wouldn't work. Well, your yard, this would be for an automatic sprinkler system, so your yard would be broken up into what's called zones. So you'd have slices, just like slices of a pizza. So what I'm asking is, will the controller handle individual zones differently? Yes, yes, and uh, you can set, that's, that's exactly right. Yep, and we'll get into that a little bit more here in just a minute. Um, if you don't have an automatic sprinkler system and you're not managing your yard in that way, then um, there, there are still controllers you can use to, you know, I have a controller that I use for my vegetable garden. I don't have an automatic irrigation system. I had to, it's, you know, I use hoses and drip irrigation and things. You can still use these controllers uh, or controllers similar to this, uh, but these specifically what I'm talking about here is for folks who have an in-ground irrigation system, one that's an automatic irrigation system. Yes, sir. Are, are we still on the even? City of Edmond is, is permanently on odd even watering uh, based on your address. Yeah. So, so yeah. the, the most often we can water over there, I guess, would be three and a half days a week, essentially, average out. Depending on your address, yeah, you, it would be three to four days a week, right? So, or it, it's basically more like a calendar month, so you're thinking about, thinking about it less in, in weeks and more in the month as a whole, but yes. Uh, if you're if you're following the city's ordinances, um, then then that would be correct. Yes. And whose responsibility is it to report your irrigation to the city? You know, is that the homeowner's the, responsibility or the people that install it? So the question is, whose responsibility is it to report? Re report? Are you report if you install a system. Um, I'm not. I, I know a little about the city of Edmond's ordinances. I would have to refer you to somebody who works with the city of Edmond. Um, as, as far as I know, when you, when you have an irrigation system installed, all that you have to do is there has to be a permit pulled for the connection to the city's main supply. And so what you're doing there is a, a certified, a licensed plumber is working with the irrigation contractor and they are making sure that the, that, that, that point of connection to the city's main supply is, is done uh, safely and done according to standard protocol. And so usually there will be a code enforcement officer from the city that comes out and verifies that, but usually that's, that's done later. So what will happen is a plumber will, will do the connection to the main line and they'll connect your home irrigation system to the main supply. And then a, a, they'll leave the, the connection open and exposed and then an inspector will come verify it and then they get the okay to, to cover it back up and, and move on. Um, but as far as uh, you as a homeowner reporting anything, there's no burden of responsibility on that at this point for you to do that. Hey Josh, I don't want to get you too far track, but can you talk about a potential certification for sprinkler installers? Sure. So, so the question is uh, regarding certification for sprinkler um, installation people, contractors. Currently in Oklahoma, there, there is no, uh, if, you're, if you're a plumber, you have to be licensed and bonded and you have to have a certain level of credentials to operate as a plumber. Currently there, there are no rules that regulate landscape irrigation contractors. And so uh, there, there are some efforts and opportunities to have some rules in place for you know, certain levels of education, certain standards that that are in place for people who install sprinkler systems. Um, certainly there are a lot of great sprinkler system companies out there that do great jobs and follow, um, follow good practices. 
there are also those that don't. And so having some sort of standardization of, of practice is something that uh, communities like the city of Edmond, city of Oklahoma City, and others uh, in the metro area are considering and looking at as they look at planning for um, ordinances into the future. So great question. So really quickly, uh, I have a lot of slides and not a lot of time, but really quickly, um, the standard irrigation controllers that you'll find around homes that are that you might have, uh, you know, if you bought a home and you just had a controller on the wall, um, are going to be usually Hunter, Irritrol, Rainbird, or Toro. Those are kind of like the big flagship brands, the Chevy, Ford, Dodge, you know, those, those of the irrigation industry. And uh, they're all great brands. They're all all pretty similar. Um, a standard controller is going to allow you to do a few things. You, I, I talked about it being like a kitchen timer. So it, it, it's going to let you um, set programs so you can set times to water and you can set multiple what are called programs. So where you could have um, basically layers of watering. So if you wanted to water at 5 a.m. and you had a um, you know these zones watering at one time and then program B would be maybe only a couple zones watering later in the day at a different time. So that allows you to have kind of layers of schedules. Um, the seasonal adjust feature that I just talked about is also a feature. And then you, you can also do what's called a test all zones function. You, you, can, you can turn it to the system test, press start, and it will one by one run through each zone for you. And so when you, if you choose to do the, the checkup on your home sprinkler system that we provided instructions on how to do that in your, in your folders, you'll use that system test and you'll walk through your landscape and you can, you can actually watch it operate and, and look for issues that need to be addressed. Um, some of the problems though that we have with sprinklers, uh, with controllers are that schedules are based on our best guess like we've just talked about. And I, I hope I've given you some um, quick tips on kind of how to think about watering. But typically it's a, it's a best guess for homeowners and so it can be confusing and it can be a headache. Also standard controllers don't really allow us the opportunity to irrigate remotely. Um, so let's say we travel a lot, we go on vacation, <laughs> they don't allow us or afford us the flexibility to control what our landscape is doing if we're not there. All right. Whereas smart controllers are more like a thermostat. So anybody have the og &E smart hours in their home? No? Anybody have uh, a Nest smart home thermostat? Okay. So if you're familiar with some of those things, smart controllers are kind of heading into that direction in that they allow, um, they allow you to take control of the management of your landscape and take it from just a timer that you set and it dings off and on and that's the control level of control you have to where you've got real time. And what I mean by that, like I can pull up my phone right here with the Wi-Fi based controller that I've installed at our extension office and I can turn on the system and turn it off right now. I can see when it last watered. I'll get uh, text messages if, if it decides to delay watering because we have rain forecasted. So those are all some of the benefits of smart irrigation systems, uh, smart irrigation controllers. And so ultimately, it's not just all about the, the flashy bells and whistles. I, I like technology. Um, you know, it can be fun to have um, some of the access on your smartphone and things, but it's, it's about more than that. It's actually taking some of the stress of managing uh, your sprinkler system and managing the water in your landscape and it's automating it based on what the real-time weather information is for your um, for your site and so this is a picture of me at our extension system converting from our old controller over to a smart controller that picture there on the right and this you can see after after I'm done talking this is actually the controller I installed um, there are lots of different controllers out there but this one here is a is a good one because uh, it's affordable. I think a lot of people think technology, smart irrigation control, they see dollar signs. You can walk into Home Depot, Lowe's, any of the box stores, you can go to any of the irrigation supply houses here in the metro and you can buy controllers like this starting around $99. Um, so the price difference from a standard controller now is really not much different. So if you are at a point where you're deciding to replace your irrigation controller, I would encourage you to consider looking at some of the smart controller options. Um, so like I said, they allow for self-adjusting of watering times. Um, they can give you remote access of your irrigation system. 
they simplify things for you. They're, they're now affordable and over about the past 15 years, the EPA has done a lot of research and they can really achieve you sizable water savings. Um, so how do they work? They, they're gonna be work, working based on that word I told you earlier, ET. So you, when you set up your irrigation system, you set up the app, it'll ask you a few questions. What type of you know, grass do you have? It'll say what kind of generally what soils do you have? You give it some information and then it uses that, creates algorithms and takes in information and it, and it builds custom watering schedules for you. Um, there, there are two types of smart irrigation controllers. So the one I'm, I'm talking about um, that's taking in weather information would be what's called a Wi-Fi based. So all the information that it's getting every few minutes is, is based on a Wi-Fi connection. It's taking in that information from local weather stations and then it's using that to modify the schedule that you've, that you've put in place for your irrigation system. Um, but there are other types of controllers that you can use which are just using simple things like a rain-free sensor um, or a soil moisture sensor and they're, you're just taking readings right there on, on site uh, sounds complicated, but it's not. A, a rain-free sensor is a $15 device that you can install yourself, and anytime it rains, it's going to shut your system off if it was scheduled to, ru uh, to run. Anytime it gets below a certain temperature, it's going to shut your system off if it was scheduled to rain. Um, all this to tell you, this technology is great, but it's not going to fix a bad system. If you, so if you have all sorts of leaks and issues and repairs that need to be um, made, I would encourage you to address those before you think about any of these efficient technologies. So again, the, the two types of controllers you see there, some are gonna work more with uh, what I would call add-ons to the controller and then others are working using um, you know, information that's coming into the controller. So the, the smart controllers are not using weather stations, they're actually taking uh, readings right there on your site. An example of that would be like this Toro Evolution controller. It's using, a, you see here on this bottom right corner, a little device that is measuring the temperature, uh, rainfall, wind speeds, and it's using that to, to determine whether it should have your irrigation system running or not. Soil moisture sensors work by, this, this one in particular is put down at the, the turf level on the, in the ground. It has this probe that pokes down into the ground and it's taking real-time readings of the moisture percentage of your soil. And if your moisture level falls below um, a certain percentage, it will, it will allow your irrigation system to come on. Just some more information, so a rain-free sensor. You may have seen little things like this on the, the eaves or guttering of houses. Those are rain-free sensors and what they're doing is that they're, they're detecting moisture. If, if rainfall's happening, then it's gonna shut off the, uh, the scheduled irrigation event. And they have some that are wireless and then some that you have to wire back to the controller. Question regarding freezing, do you think it's necessary to winterize your sprinkler system? So the question is, is it necessary to winterize your sprinkler system? Um, as a whole, conventionally, you don't have to do a, a major winterization regime here in Oklahoma. Typically, if the system was installed correctly, um, there, the, lines were put below what's the, the freeze line. Um, if they're shallow lines, then, and you're irrigating in winter months, and certainly there can be some issues that crop up, and so it, it really uh, will depend on your situation. Um, traditionally, no, we don't do a full winterization. If you have an outdoor backflow, which, you know, if you have a rock in your yard that's covering some irrigation pipe, uh, that's called a backflow preventer. Sometimes there are some, some things that um, you'll wanna do to make sure that if you're operating, you have tall fescue, so if you're operating your irrigation system around t temperatures that, that could be um, freezing, then, then there can be some issues. But typically it takes a really hard freeze. Uh, we're talking, you know, single digit temperatures to really cause major issues. And so a lot of times just simply not running your system for a few days before a freeze, bleeding some of the, the lines, um, those, that's enough. Um, but there is a, a simple winterization process that I can walk you through. And I usually teach a class, I actually taught one here at the, um, at the MAC. Uh, last fall on winterizing your irrigation system. So uh, we can plan to do something like that again this year and, and I'd welcome you to come and um, attend that or you can reach out to me and I can send you the slides on, on how that works. Um, but yes, there, there are some things you can do to make sure that your system is um, ready for winter. Now, many of you have probably seen this happening. This, I see this happening all the time. Not only is it wasting water, but it actually is causing damage. So this year we had an immense amount of rain. We've had 
we've had probably double, um, in some areas triple, some areas of the states triple our yearly average rainfall and we're only halfway through the year, right? So um, this year especially, it's been an issue. When you overwater, you're not just wasting water, but you're causing erosion, you're causing all sorts of issues in your landscape. Here in, in um, the hot month of July, if we have tall fescue and we're irrigating very, very frequently, all that humidity and moisture that's right there at the ground level causes severe uh, fungal disease issues to crop up sometimes in our, in our turf. So brown patch um, and other fungal diseases that you experience with your turf grass oftentimes can, if not be eliminated, can be, can be um, greatly, the, the symptoms can be greatly reduced by pulling back on the, the frequency of irrigation and not over irrigating. Uh, this is an example of, of what could happen if you're watering around freezing temperatures. I always joke that, that these folks were uh, uh, headed to vacation in Florida or something and go into a sunny beach and they, they forgot that Oklahoma uh, can go from, you know, 60 degrees one day to, to 20 degrees the next. And so they had their irrigation system set to run and they, they got caught by a freak freeze and uh, they, they were none the wiser because they were at the beach and uh, their neighbors were, uh, were left to, to watch this happen. And um, this is not something to joke around about though. This happens a lot around the metro area, especially in the winter, and it, it can be very dangerous. It can cause people to fall, it can cause accidents. And so certainly having some mechanism, either turning your system off or having some mechanism to prevent it from running in freezing temperatures is important. Uh, soil moisture sensors, I won't beat this too much, but they are nice. Uh, if, you're, if you're wanting to, to truly uh, become as efficient as possible in terms of you know being the, the 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 nerdy geek about how you water soil moisture sensors are kind of the way to do that over several years several universities have researched soil moisture sensors and you can achieve 50 percent reduction in water use and and improve your landscape results while doing it if you are using soil moisture as the basis of how you water um, and there are different different ways of doing that, but essentially what you're doing is you're trying to manage the water in the soil profile and anytime it gets below about 50% soil moisture, you, you start to water again. So you're letting it dry out, filling it back up, letting it dry out, filling it back up. Um, it's like you have a glass of, you know, a glass of lemonade. Rather than filling your glass up when you're at three, three fourths, you drink, the, you drink the glass about halfway down or all the way down and then you, and then you fill it back up before you drink it again. So what does that look like? You're waiting for it to dry back down to a point where it starts to almost cause the plant stress and then you water again, okay? So Wi-Fi based controllers, I talked a little bit about those. Those are kind of the, the, the trendy thing and kind of the next, the next thing in terms of how we manage um, our irrigation. So there's the nest and, and thermostats, kind of the smart thermostats. Well, a lot of that is transitioning into irrigation controllers. I went to the Irrigation Association trade show a few years back and they had a lot of the smartphone or the uh, irrigation controllers hooked up to Amazon, uh, Alexa, Google Home, those, those kind of things. And you can actually now, if you, if you were to choose to, you can speak your controller into operation. So you can say, hey Alexa, water my front yard and it will come on. And so the, there's some, some of those things that are um, kind of the the new technology trends for irrigation. Um, I don't get too excited about that kind of stuff, but what I do get excited about is, is things like having access in the palm of my hand wherever I'm at to managing um, the irrigation of my landscape. So here's some of the, the different controllers you'll find out there. The Ratio is probably the most popular. It's gonna be around the 250 to $300 mark. And this is what it would look like if you had the app. So you actually see, pic you can take pictures of your landscape here and you can name each zone. So if you wanted zone one, you could say front yard turf, or you, know, you could name each zone and have pictures of it. Um, and you can, you can set the, this is set to seven minutes. So you just drag it to seven minutes and hit run now. And right here from this room, you could be watering your landscape if you chose to. This is the controller that we have at our extension center. Like I said, this one's $99 off the shelf at any of the big box stores. And this is what the, the app looks like. Many of these are, are now capable. Um, I know a Rentio has some degree of that. I don't know about the other. The, the Hydro Rain, the, the 
current model, I'm not sure about. I know they're working towards that. The model we have does not allow for that, but there are several models that, that do. Uh, SkyDrop is one, Ratio is one. The HydroWise is another controller. I don't think that they allow the, the smart home uh, integration yet, but this is Hunter's version of a smart controller. Yep, and that picture I showed you earlier of me standing there with wires, if you've ever wired in a ceiling fan, all you're doing is unconnecting wires and then putting them back in place. And it's like putting a new ceiling fan in. So you wanna, you wanna label them, you know, zone one, two, and three so that you don't cross wires or whatever, but it's very simple to do. And uh, if you didn't wanna do it, you could always hire it out to a contractor and it's usually a, you know, a standard um, one hour site visit. So you might be a hundred to $200 fee to have somebody do it for you. Um, the, the potential with smart products is 70 to 80% increase in efficiency. So you can actually reduce the amount of water you're using uh, or wasting by up to 80% if you really hone in and, and utilize some of these products in conjunction with you know, having a good system design. Is that taking you just using your existing sprinkler heads or do you need to change out the heads to the new? Well, as, as a whole, so this is, that's kind of a generality, but as a whole, if you were to implement, you know, using, um, you know, addressing high pressure, if that was an issue, using high efficiency nozzles, uh, using, short, you know, the, the whole package could achieve you up to 80% efficiency. Um, and again, I just want to emphasize this technology doesn't, doesn't fix a bad system. And so I, I wish that, that many of you had been here at the, the first workshop where we really dug into some of the, the core issues. And I'd be happy to talk on the phone with you, uh, do, do whatever I can to assist you with any of the, the more, um, uh, you know, specific questions you have about maintenance and repair of your sprinkler systems or uh, specific questions about how long to, to set a sprinkler system. If I were to give you a quick recap, yep. Your, your presentation from last week is in their packet. So presentation from last week is in your packet, and, and I also want to remind you, I, f I forgot um, Dr. Moore mentioned at the beginning that these videos are recorded, and so we actually have last week's presentation on the City of Edmond conservation page, and so you can go this afternoon and watch it. Uh, put, in, put in a bag of popcorn in the microwave, put your feet up, and, and uh, watch Dr. Moore and I talk to you a little bit. Um, if, in summary, if I were to kind of put all this into perspective and give you, you know, four or five quick tips to take home, this is what I'd like to leave you with. Um, July being the, the peak month for outdoor water use is a good time to think about your sprinkler systems. So it's a good time to do a little visual inspection if you have a, a sprinkler system already. If you don't have a sprinkler system, then it's a good time to think about um, how, you, how you address the water needs of your landscape in a, an extremely hot um, month. And so I'm sure if you, ha you, you folks here have been dealing with the, uh, the sad looking plants and, and needing water. And so it's, it's, it's taken either throwing your hands up and saying, forget it, I give up, or you've been out there with a hose um, trying to water stuff. And so having, having a, a plan in place without an automatic sprinkler system is good. Um, If you get an automatic irrigation system, you know, there's really no uh, good or bad time. I'll tell you that, that contractors are gonna be busiest in the spring and, and summer. So, you know, fall or early spring could be good times. People without automatic sprinkler systems have been shown as, you know, again, a generality, but EPA research says as a whole across the United States, people that have automatic sprinkler systems use 50% more water outdoors than those that don't. Now, they probably have nicer yards and landscapes <laughs> than those that don't, but they're using, they're using more water. So there's nothing wrong with not having a sprinkler system. Please don't, don't, um, don't think I'm trying to say that. In fact, I, I don't have one at home and I, and I get by. Now, I, I curse sometimes, but I get by. Um, and I can certainly help you think through, but July is a good time to think about your system. Um, it's, it's a good time to, to also think about how often and how long you're watering. And so you're, again, think about the saturating of the root zone. Think about if you have turf grass, that root zone's only a foot deep. If you've got a tree, that root zone's several feet deep. So with my trees, I drag a little hose and I let it trickle for hours and hours and hours to get water all the way down to that root zone. With my turf, you know, I'm, I, I water for, you know, a period of 20, 30 minutes and then, and then cut it off. Um, if you, 
use a rain freeze shutoff sensor or, or some simple sen sensor, you can uh, effectively take the headache away of, not, of worrying about you know, when your system's gonna come on. And then smart irrigation controllers, lastly, are a great way to use less water, have your yard looking better than it did when you were using more water, and take some of the headache and management out of your system.